Hello, my name is Indresh Shrivastava, and I am going to be uh, giving um, this uh, masterclass on the vaccine characterization. So, um, yeah. So here is my 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 slides. I think for for you to take a look at that. Um, so the title slide. I'm the vice president at um, uh, Novavax. I recently joined Novavax. Um, the second slide, I just want to show that there is a continuing um, race between the scientists and the pathogens. I think we, so we scientists, we try to make the vaccine so to control the disease um, and the pathogens, I think they try to, um, to, to infect us um, so that they can cause the endemic, uh, pandemic. In, in case of um, several um, times, I think that the Spanish flu of 1914, malaria, cholera, polio, and more recently, I think for COVID-19, I think they, they uh, the pathogen won and they caused the pandemic. Then I think the scientists, we came back and we developed the vaccine for the effective drug. So it is very important to understand that uh, there is always a race for, for survival by the pathogens, and, and there is an effort by scientists to control the disease. This is how the presentation is uh, organized. So we would like to talk to you or share with you my vision and challenges in developing the vaccine and the vaccine platforms that are being used for developing the historical and the modern vaccines. Then the rationale for, or what are the reasons for performing vaccine characterization? What type of assays can be used? and um, then how these assays can be applied for the bioanalytical compatibility, which is critical when we are doing the vaccine production at multiple sites, when we are licensing the facilities, new facilities, or when we are developing the new processes. I think we obviously don't want to do the, the clinical trial or we, we should have tried to avoid doing the clinical trial, uh, clinical trial in order to manage the cost and um, the timeline. So again, I think this is, these are the platforms that have been used for the historical vaccine. They are simple. It's a killed vaccine, so a live attenuated vaccine, isolate, inactivate, and, and inject. This is another approach. I think these are all based on the postures principle for vaccine development. I think um, um, at uh, probably mid uh, to late uh, um, 20th century, I think people started using recombinant vaccines. Again, this is the, the, the slide that shares the uh, modern vaccine platforms. I think one is the DNA delivery, vector-based, recombinant protein, and mRNA. It's a viral replication particle, VRP, and then virus-like particle, that is VLP. I think uh, we all are fully aware of the, um, of the accomplishment of mRNA platform that has developed um, the COVID-19 vaccine in probably the record time. Also the vector has been used for developing the, the COVID-19 vaccine, I think both by Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca. And then the recombinant vaccine is not too far behind. There are two companies which are playing a critical role in developing the recombinant vaccine for COVID. One is Novavax, where, which, is, which has completed phase three trial and then Sanofi Pasteur is, has initiated the phase three trial. So there's a lot of work has been done rather very quickly on these three platform. Effort is also being undergoing in terms of looking at the DNA, looking at the combination approach. The, the pluses that we are seeing at, um, um, at, at, at um, for each platform, this is, this is the perceived safety and potency <clears throat> for individual platform. This is my view. It is not represent either Novavax or any other company's uh, version. This slide shows that uh, understanding the correlate of protection is very, very important for successful development of the vaccine. For when we understood that antibody is a correlate of protection, we have developed very quickly a number of vaccines, a number of vaccines. Um, it has been a little bit of challenging to do develop, um, where, develop the vaccines where the correlate of protection is cell-mediated or T-cells. 
Um, but uh, in recent years, I think Shingris has came up where the um, correlator protection is totally phase G cell or um, a poly 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 specific uh, P cell and, and epitope. And I think this is what is probably a good example. It may be because of the adjuvant that they are, that uh, the vaccine is using, but nevertheless, I think it's a very very good um, 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 development for the vaccine development. Other part, which is very important for us to understand it, that uh, developing a vaccine is, um, is, is very successful when there is little or no antigenic uh, diversity or variability, as it is shown by this red um, panel here. But once the, the variability is start, I think um, the developing the vaccine is a little bit more uh, complicated. In terms of influenza and COVID-19, they are together in terms of um, antigenic variability. And as I said on the, on the left-hand side, that they have comparable antigenic diversity for COVID, new variants are coming up. And um, these, these variants are not usually different, but they have the mutations in the critical receptor binding site. My, my perception is that the COVID vaccine in the long term will be a, sim a seasonal vaccine similar to the influenza vaccine. Moving into the part that um, why it is important to perform vaccine characterization. There, is a, there are a number of reasons, but the most important reason is that we need to establish batch-to-batch -batch consistency, it means the quality of the vaccine is maintained um, whether the vaccine is produced at one site or multiple sites, all the batches has a similar quality attribute. It is important um, for the vaccine efficacy and the safety. We can also, it is also needed to it may demonstrate the stability formulation development, develop the potency assays that can use to reflect the efficacy of the vaccine. The structural characterization is required for monitoring the confirmation of homogeneity. And um, since viral proteins are glycosylated, therefore glycosylation profiling is uh, critical. We don't want the glycosylation profile um, change either during the upstream or downstream that may impact the potency of the vaccine. Monitoring the exposure of the critical functional epitope is also necessary. And then last but not least, I think we need to demonstrate that the assay that we are using, they are stability indicating and then how, how to use these assays for bioanalytical bio compatibility. Then in this section, I think I'll, I focus on in terms of analytical tools that can be used for vaccine characterization. As I'm the listing here is that the different um, steps, at different steps, we need different set of assays and I will walk you through. For vaccine characterization, both characterizing the product and impurity is very, very critical. Characterizing the product is critical to maintain the vaccine efficacy and characterizing the impurity is critical for vaccine safety. For um, uh, characterizing the product, I think we do perform in-process testing. And in the in-process testing, we focus normally on uh, doing the SDS page or determining the purity. We also look at the, the degradation profile and how the product is becoming more pure with, um, with, the, with the later stage processes. So we look at the homogeneity and also we look at the potency by doing an analyzer. And then comes <clears throat> the second main part that is a characterization of vaccines. So essentially, um, first we do the immunological characterization that is going to be based on ELISA Western blot, then we do the purity by SDS page, size exclusion, the reverse phase, and, and mass spec. And then we start using the biophysical methods for um, characterization of the vaccine, such as CD spectroscopy, light scattering, differential scanning, calorimetry, and then reverse phase, tryptophan fluorescence, glycosylation, and then transmission electron microscopy. Again, I think not all these assays need to be performed, but this is what we need to, or, or 
uh, we need to decide early on in the project that what is says are critical and what needs to be performed. In terms of the product release, I think we need to focus on potency, identity, purity, and then the residuals in terms of host cell DNA, in terms of the host cell protein, in terms of the bio burden, in terms of endotoxin, and the process residuals. So that, that uh, combines the aspects of vaccine characterization and release. Again, I think as I mentioned it, that uh, change in the tertiary structure, secondary structure, aggregation state, degradation, all these things will um, compromise the vaccine potency and develop the, the suboptimal vaccine. So therefore, I think uh, monitoring all these aspects by different uh, characterization is, is critical for successful vaccine production or manufacturing. I will give you two examples. One is based on chikungunya vaccine. Another is based on the trimeric HIV protein. This is the work that we did at um, uh, Novartis, and this is the work that was done at um, VRC when I was at the VRC. VRC. So VLP has uh, three proteins, E1, E2, and capsid protein. Together, there are 240 copies of each protein on the VLP. And the mass is, um, is a giant, it's a, it's a big, big, big um, protein. It's about 67, 68 nanometer um, structure. VLP, um, the trauma is um, the three copies of HIV envelope protein, GP120, they come together and then produce the trimer. The mass is about 400 to 420 kilodalton. The first part we want to show is the purity and identity. And this is the example is chikungunya vaccine. The first thing what we did is a STS page analysis. You can see that here we have E1, E2 protein. This is the capsid protein. All three proteins are present. And then we showed um, uh, the Western blot analysis to demonstrate the identity of the, of the vaccine. This is the example that I'm showing you for um, HIV trimeric protein. This is the native STS page, uh, a native um, gel where we are showing this is the, the trimer. This is the monomer. The ratio is about 60, 70% trimer and about 20, 30% we are getting about in the monomer. I think these trimers that do dissociate um, during, uh, during the, the, the purification and formulation process. The same data is here. This is what the trimer looks like. This is what the monomer looks like. And this is the reverse phase um, assay. Again, I'm showing you the data on the two batches. Next, we want to show you about the potency, how we develop the potency assay. Potency assay is a uh, rather uh, main aspect, but it does take time to develop it. So in this case, what we did, we developed a number of monoclonal antibodies. We tested them for their neutralizing potential, and then we used them to develop a capture ELISA. And here are the two monoclonals that are being used for uh, in, the, in the potency method. And as you can say, that uh, these are the four or five batches that we have tested and characterized um, in terms of the potency. This is what we have done, the BCA on those uh, um, uh, drug substance batches. And you can see the ratio between ELISA to BCA is between 80 to 120%, which is really, very good. I think in terms of the products are consistent. Then we show the homogeneity. I think so we have tested all these drug substance batches in the um, size exclusion HPLC analysis. And you can say that all these benches can be really overlaid. The peaks are symmetrical and there is not um, change in the retention time. We calibrated the column using these two standards here. Next, we want to show you that uh, the DLS analysis that we have done, DLS is dynamic light scattering. It is being used to develop the particle size and here we have um, overlaid four batches of the VLPs. And you can see that there's a perfect overlay. The sizes are between 66 to 68 nanometer. So it is um, very um, a small variability and the polydiversity index is extremely low, suggesting the high quality VL, um, DLS data. Again, this example is for um, uh, trimer Trimeric protein. Here we are using multi-angle light scattering in conjunction, in conjunction with the 
um, size exclusion and the reflective index. And what, what we are trying to show you here is that there is there are two main um, uh, peaks or um, components. One has about 420 nanometer and the other is slightly smaller, which is 3.56. So I think this may be due to um, maybe slight aggregation is coming out here that may be increasing the, um, the size as calculated by the software. Nevertheless, I think that these are the two batches and both the batches are giving us comparable data set. For um, uh, uh, VLP vaccine, because it has three proteins together, as the E1, E2, and capsid protein, we wanted to make sure that we are able to um, uh, quantify those. So we have separated out, we treated the VLP and did the reverse phase HPLC analysis. We can see that all three proteins are there, E1, E2, and, and capsid. And this is what we have done um, to demonstrate to identify them using the Western plot. Again, I think we wanted to do the transmission electron micros analysis for the VLP. And as you can see, with the VLP are very homogeneous. We did the carbohydrate analysis and it is shown, shown here is that uh, predominant carbohydrate that we are detecting on the VLP is the terminal mannose. Uh, for HIV envelope protein, we are seeing both the terminal mannose as well as the com complex carbohydrate. So this is a differential um, glycosylation profile. But the good news is that the profile is consistent for both these two batches. Going on to the next um, set of um, uh, tools, and this is for characterization of the secondary and tertiary structure. So I will just walk you through. So the first method that I'm going to show you is the CD spectroscopy. And, and, and as you can see on the left-hand side, I think that uh, vaccine or any protein, depending upon what it has, it may have a um, uh, different profile. Look at the black profile. This is where if you have predominantly alpha helix, then this is what the profile you may see. If you have the beta sheet, that you will see a profile similar to the red line. And if you have random coil, then you will see a profile similar to um, the green line. So this is the three distinct profiles you get if you have pure alpha helix beta sheet and then coil. This is an example if you take the, um, the chikungunya VLP, I think it seems like it is a combination of um, alpha helix and beta, beta sheet. But if you denature it, if you heat treat it, then you lose the secondary structure. This is the example that I'm showing you for the flu vaccine. And um, this is the work that we did at, um, and the team has done at Novartis. Here are the two aspects. One, the protein is, um, or the vaccine is kept at four degrees. And here the protein is kept at 50 degrees. Uh, four weeks, four degrees, it maintained its secondary structure, but uh, four weeks at 50 degree, it lost its secondary structure. So it is a stability indicating. It does, uh, it can be used for characterizing the vaccine, the protein, and also for um, stability uh, determination. Here is the example for chicken manure vaccine. In this vaccine, it was treated from 25 degrees to 60 degrees. And here, I think you will see that we are losing the electricity um, with, the, with, the, with the increase in the heating temperature. By the time we reach about 55, the structure is gone, the secondary structure is gone. So once again, I think it could be used for the post-degradation study. It can be also used for the real-time study, can also be used for the accelerated study. The method has a high potential. Again, showing you the uh, tryptophan fluorescence um, spectroscopy. Here, I think on the left-hand side is the conceptual idea. The tryptophan, the intrinsic fluorescence, I think the intrinsic uh, fluorescence, fluorescence state is red. So they get a uh, uh, maximum spectra is probably around 340, but as the protein get oxidized, the tryptophan changes the color to greenish yellow. And that's where the spectra is gonna be shifting to 350, 360. Here is an example, the blue line, this is the vaccine, this is the time zero, and then it is four weeks and six weeks at 50 degree, um, the, 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 
storage and you can see that the spectral uh, spectral profile has started changing from 357 358 like here or 360 then it is really really going more to the, the right hand side and here i think we are getting two transitions one is about uh, the same uh, probably around 360 370 another is about 420. So again, I think this is a stability indicating it can be used for the force degradation and the assay is a stability indicating. It can also be used um, in, in conjunction with either ELISA or Octet to determine the potency. So this assay has a lot of value. Next part, I want to show you, give you an example on the microcalorimetry and what it can be used for. So there are two methods. One is the isothermal titration calorimetry. This is called ITC. And this is a differential scanning calorimetry. This is called DSC. So isothermal titration calorimetry is being used if you want to look at the receptor ligand interaction. And for example, in HIV envelope, we have um, three uh, CD4, pediatric CD4 binding site. In case of COVID, we may also have um, three um, is to receptor binding site, and that can be used to demonstrate if all the three sites are open or, or, or accessible or not accessible. Uh, differential scanning calorimetry, I think it does provide us an idea about uh, the thermal stability or unfolding of the protein. Here are the example, I think in, in the left-hand panel, we are showing you here that in case of HIV and the protein, which is a trimer, where we have all the three binding sites for the CD4 are open in the trimer. Again, I think if you create a different structure, the binding to CD4 has, um, is changing. And I think if you look at it, this is um, what is the monomer. This is what the trimer looks like. And these are the two versions where the V2 loop is deleted. So all these binding profiles are different. We published this work, so if you're interested, let me know. Now send you a PDF paper. This is where the DSC, in the DSC for the HIV trimer protein, we saw two transitions. We have taken the protein to the HPLC analysis and we are seeing two different profile. One, this represents the aggregated state, which has the higher thermal stability or, or um, TM. And one is the main area where um, the protein is in direct confirmation. And that's where we have um, the main translation. So again, I think this method can be used for determining the stability, determining the homogeneity and how to characterize the thermal stability of the protein. Another way to <clears throat> study the thermal stability is uh, by doing the differential scanning fluorimetry. What we have done, we, done, we developed this um, 96, well plat, uh, 96 well format where the protein is the different concentration of the protein is put it together, it mixed with the fluorescent dye, and then it is being heated in the, in the, in the fast uh, real-time PCR machine. As the protein is being unfolded, the <clears throat> fluorescent dye, it does interact with the hydrophobic patches and then give rise to the fluorescence. We have used this technique to determine to, to, to for the force degradation study. The first example is if we boil heat treatment. If we boil the protein, we lose the structure as it is shown here. If we treat the protein at low pH, we destabilize the structure. It can be degraded, but if we do the low pH treatment, then not then neutralized and then test it for um, differential scanning fluorimetry, we can get some structure back. If we do the oxidization, we increase with increasing oxidizing agent, we saw the denaturation in the protein. So the technique can be used very, very effectively in, um, in the stability indicating assays in terms of measuring the force degradation. And also um, the technique can be used for the potency. So in, in, in summary, I think we are using a number of techniques, both immunological that is the beer code and ELISA. And then um, we are also using the biophysical methods that are ICT, uh, ITC, DSC, and um, CDS spectroscopy 
we are doing the triple DNA analysis to determine the purity, and we are also looking at the glycosylation profile. And, and, and in addition, we are doing the structural characterization by negative stain EM. So, in terms of uh, this is a slide I just wanted to include you um, for you to understand that uh, when you are developing the, the essays, I think you need to keep in mind that we don't need to use all the essays for everything. We need to determine that which essay is going to be critical for which aspect. And I think this is what we have listed the essays. We have listed the type of vaccine, the, the viral vaccines, and this is for the bacterial vaccine. So hopefully that may be able to help you in terms of uh, developing the essays for characterizing your vaccine. And then this is, a lot of, this is a slide that we are using it to demonstrate what is the compatibility, bioanalytical compatibility approach. So we use a combination of uh, release tests that are being performed by QC. Then the characterization, I say, that are being performed by analytical development. We combine those and develop the compatibility, bioanalytical compatibility approach. This is a very comprehensive. Again, I don't need to really rehash the conclusions, but I have uh, shown you why it is important to do the vaccine characterization, what the methods can be used for characterization, and what we um, and how to use the methods for um, uh, developing the biomedical compatibility approach. Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge my team um, at uh, VRC, at Novartis, and at Protein Sciences. And I would like to acknowledge the leadership which um, helped me in terms of um, allow me to accomplish the work that we are we have. Thank you very much for attention. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thanks again.